uh, then there are increasing studies about, and also the oldest countries, they also had the problem when they're in the colonial time, when generally that it is the fact that the colonial language become, became the official language, became the, the language of instruction. So when they have that issue in the past, and then now they're independent, again, they are facing the same kind of issue of choosing whether you want to choose a super language or your, your own language or the language. What about the small groups? That is not the majority of them. Yeah. So there is an increasing interest of the study. And then um, lots of the studies that look at the educational implications first, um, whether a language, um, whether a language, a familiar language or unfamiliar language is used in schools what kind of impact that has done on the students' learning. So, um, well, basically all of these studies, most studies recognize that um, when you talk about the medium of, of instruction, it is not an education question only. It touches about other aspects of you know, sociocultural factors, uh, whether one language is used and how, how uh, one a language is used, how that give um, a psychological impact to students, you know, how that affects your know, student self-esteem, etc. So uh, while recognizing the complexities of choosing a, a, an instructional language, um, generally the studies has taken different approaches that elect different forces, that some talking about educational impact, uh, some talking about sociocultural uh, implications. Some talking about some looking at the um, economic uh, uh, factors. Uh, when a government decide whether they want to pro provide bilingual education, then it also involving with the expenses. If it's too expensive, then they tend to not to do so, or they leave that burden to the local community to carry on. Or when uh, parents decide, they often dis decide to send their children to the school where the big language is taught. So, so to believe that it will, it will um, help the students to, their children to, um, to benefit later on, you know, economically. So um, economic considerations has been studied. And also lots of the policies has been drawn upon um, according to, to the economic considerations. And then there is an increasing dis study that look at the political implications. And it, it really look at it as a correlation of how when a nation tried to build a national identity and try to enforce a language that represent that national identity. And then also there is um, examples from Basque countries, or countries, and the countries, or countries, countries, right? Basque countries, and also in Quebec, uh, where we have a, a regional national nationalism going on. Um, there is a competing forces for that, for which language can be used. And then subsequently that language issue is also looked at, upon as a right issue, whether one is receiving your own language become a right issue that we are in the about. And it's not only uh, have been approached as a linguistic human rights issue, but also um, looked upon as a political autonomous rights issue uh, in the studies, especially done in, in the former Soviet Union um, nations. Um, th those are sort of the studies that has been, the approach that, that studies has been taking on in terms of the, what language to be used in schools. Um, inside China, by the uh, Chinese scholars and also Tibetan scholars, this issue has been discussed generally fall under the category of bilingual education. So some of the studies, especially if it is from the government side, it will talk about the achievement that the government have, has been done in order to provide bilingual education. Or some would make um, arguments based on the you know, educational uh, impacts or uh, identity side that they talk about uh, what kind of, what combination of languages should be provided so that learning is more effective. 
for the Tibetan scholars, the studies specifically, there are uh, some of them move a little bit beyond that, that looking at it not only as a bilingual education, but also look at it as a part of the curriculum, how the school learning will be more effective if we provide it. But again, it is a one way to argue for that, for that uh, mother tongue teaching in school. Uh, there are other scholars that have been uh, doing research, uh, calling for uh, the enforcement of the law, calling for the, uh, the, the uh, specific regulations to be set upon so that the, the language, uh, that the language can be taught in schools. But um, generally, the approach has been, uh, the studies inside China has been more focused on the educational implications, cultural, sociocultural implications, economic considerations, less on the political implications. Probably it is a bit sensitive trying to, to do it, trying to make an argument that talking about, about all the you know, cultural imperialism, hegemonic uh, influence of the super language, etc. Um, and less, even less was done on and approached it as a human rights issue so far. Um, when, when I talk about this um, issue, I would like to, I mean, my main um, uh, um, sort of topic, uh, my main sort of, uh, uh, the thing that I want to talk most today is about the policy change. Um, I want, would like first to uh, introduce you about sort of the theory and the model that the minority policy in China has based on. Because if you look at the minority policy, <coughs> the language for minorities is part of that minority policy. Um, and then we sort of have an idea how the policy has been developed, how uh, you know, the, the decision has been made. Um, the minority policy in China was uh, built, was sort of developed based on the Soviet model. Uh, even before 1950s, but specifically after 1950s, China Chinese government has borrowed uh, the Soviet model for the minority uh, sort of management, of minority policy. And uh, um, also the Soviet Union has actively lent their model to China. So uh, uh, there are two uh, basic components that form the minority policy of China based on the Soviet uh, model. First is that it's recognized, because it's the communist ideology, it recognized the equal rights among all groups, whether you're big groups or, or you're a small group. If there is an equal rights, that is a very important feature of the policy based on the Soviet model. And uh, what's different from the Soviet model is that the Soviet Union actually recognized that, that all those um, uh, different groups are still like, there are separate nations under a super sort of um, nation state. So it is a multinational uh, sort of state. Uh, for China, they have a decision to make whether they will leave self-determination or, or you know, try to leave it aside and, and only take autonomous rights. So after, there, there is a detailed discuss of that, well, that part of history. <laughs> but uh, at the end, that uh, for the biology policy, it is based on autonomous rights, uh, autonomous regional rights. 